They say another major earthquake is eventually coming. Are there enough ways to get people out of here? It is not a matter of if one will hit, it's a matter of when. when. A shocking discovery in the new Madrid seismic zone has the world gripped with terror. Evidence has emerged of a catastrophic geological event brewing beneath the heartland, one that could violently rewrite the map of North America as we know it. Chilling first-hand accounts and prophetic visions depict a future of unimaginable devastation and continent-shattering forces. Could these dire predictions finally be coming true? Is the sleeping giant about to awaken from its billion-year slumber? Join us as we explore the scary details of what emerged in New Madrid that terrifies the whole world. Is the New Madrid seismic zone a ticking time bomb? We've all heard the terrifying stories of massive earthquakes shaking the ground violently and swallowing up entire cities. But for most of us living in the heartland of America, the idea of a huge quake hitting our homes seems almost unthinkable. After all, aren't those kinds of natural disasters reserved for the West Coast folks living along those infamous fault lines? Well, we shouldn't be too confident yet because there's a seismic time bomb ticking right beneath our feet, the new Madrid seismic zone. This large region, centered about 160 miles south of St. Louis, has a dark and violent past that many of us know little about. Back in 1811-1812, it was the epicenter of a series of earthquakes so powerful they rewrote the geological map of the Mississippi Valley. It was a ground-shaking, earth-splitting mayhem on an unimaginable scale. One survivor, Eliza Bryan, painted a chilling picture of those final nights of terror in the town of New Madrid itself. On February 7, 1812, as the biggest quake hit, the mighty Mississippi River turned into a raging monster. The waters first receded so far that boats were stranded on dry land. Then, in the blink of an eye, a tall 15, 20-foot wave came crashing back, sweeping up those helpless vessels and hurling them a quarter mile inland with unrelenting force. But that was just the start of the nightmare. As the quake unleashed its fury, the very earth seemed to come apart at the stitchings. Vast cracks opened up, spitting sand, rocks, and even thick plumes of smoke from the bowels of the planet. Trees were ripped from the ground like mere twigs, stranding fish high and dry as the river's course changed forever. One witness recounted seeing entire groves of cottonwood trees deliberately pulled down by the swiftly changing waters, a haunting image of nature's raw power. In the weeks and months that followed, over 2,000 aftershocks continued to rock the region, a stark reminder that this was no ordinary earthquake. Scientific estimates now place the magnitude of those massive quakes at a staggering 7.5 to 7.8 on the Richter scale, on par with the catastrophic 1906 San Francisco tremor. And perhaps most scariest of all, experts say the New Madrid fault line is still very much alive with the potential for another big one in the future. So what in the world is going on under our feet to cause such seismic chaos in the middle of America? Well, stay tuned because this gets a little complicated. Most of the earthquakes we think of happen along the edges of the giant tectonic plates that make up the Earth's crust. When these massive plates collide and grind against each other, all that built-up stress gets released in the form of violent shaking. But the new Madrid zone is different. It's located right in the heart of the North American plate and far from any boundaries. So how can such potent quakes possibly be brewing here? The answer lies deep underground in the very composition of the land itself. Imagine a huge pit filled with layer upon layer of loose wet sand and mud stretching downwards for over half a mile beneath cities like Memphis. This soggy, liquefied ground is a ticking time bomb during strong quakes. When that loose, saturated soil gets violently shaken, it can start behaving like a thick fluid rather than solid earth. The increasing pressure causes the soil grains to lose their grip on each other, turning the ground into something likely to quicksand. Roads, bridges, buildings, anything sitting on top risks being swallowed up as the earth itself turns to liquid. This terrifying phenomenon is called soil liquefaction and it's what caused those massive sand blows to explode geysers of water, mud, and sand that witnesses reported seeing during the 1811-1812 quakes. Even today, 
you can still find scattered pale spots across the Mississippi Valley, marking the sites of these violent eruptions from the past. Some of these ancient craters are absolutely massive, 50 to 60 meters across with rims over a meter thick. Just imagine the incredible subterranean forces required to blast out such gaping wounds in the earth. It gives you a powerful sense of the sheer, unrelenting fury these quakes unleashed. And here's maybe the most unsettling part. Many scientists believe the New Madrid zone is one of the most likely places on the planet for this kind of destructive soil liquefaction to occur again. The very geological makeup of the land, that thick, waterlogged substrate, is a ticking time bomb, just waiting to be triggered by the next big shockwave. Speaking of shockwaves, there's another reason the New Madrid quakes were so widespread and destructive. The Earth's crust in the eastern U.S. is much older and denser than the relatively young, thin crust out west. This allows seismic vibrations to travel much farther, which is why the 1811-1812 quakes were felt as far away as New York City. To put this in perspective, let's compare earthquake maps from different parts of the country. A magnitude 5.7 quake that hit California in 2013 caused noticeable shaking within about a 300-kilometer radius. However, a quake of nearly identical strength hit Virginia in 2011, and this time, the intense shaking reached over 250 kilometers further, all the way to cities like Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. The dense, ancient crust in the east is just way better at transmitting those seismic shock waves over vast distances. And if that's not alarming enough, think about this. Much of the eastern U.S. infrastructure and communities simply aren't prepared for a massive earthquake the way places like California are. Our buildings aren't as quake-proof, our populations aren't as trained on what to do, and emergency resources would be rapidly overwhelmed. A powerful New Madrid quake could literally redraw the map of the Mississippi Valley today. So, are we just sitting ducks, helpless in the face of this seismic time bomb? Scientists say current estimates put the probability of a magnitude 6.0 or greater quake in the New Madrid zone within the next 50 years at between 25 and 40 percent, alarmingly high odds when you consider the damage such a quake could unleash. But here's the thing. The science around forecasting these kinds of intraplate quakes is still very new and inaccurate. We don't yet fully understand what triggers the buildup of stresses so far from a tectonic plate boundary. Predicting the timing and magnitude of future quakes remains extremely difficult. What we do know for sure is this. The New Madrid seismic zone has a long repeated history of generating earthquakes on a massive, catastrophic scale, unlike almost anywhere else on the continent. Whether the next big one is decades or centuries away, one thing is certain. It will rewrite the geography and put millions of lives at risk when it happens. The question is, how prepared will we be when that ominous day finally arrives? Will we heed the warnings that Mother Nature has left buried in the sands of the Mississippi Valley? The choice is ours. Ignoring the past could be disastrous, but facing the harsh realities of science may be what ultimately protects us. In the meantime, the New Madrid seismic zone remains both an ominous threat and a fascinating geological mystery just beneath our feet waiting for science to crack its secrets before the next inevitable unleashing of its terrible force. When Mother Nature unleashes her fury, how do you escape? Hundreds of thousands of lives hang in the balance as researchers race to find evacuation routes before it's too late. Let's find out. Escape and evacuation routes. There's a potential crisis brewing in the central United States that could really shake things up if we're not prepared. You've already heard about the New Madrid seismic zone and the risk of a major earthquake striking the region. Well, scientists are saying it's just a matter of time before this happens. Imagine you're going about your normal day when suddenly the ground starts violently shaking. Buildings sway, roads crack open, and bridges look extremely unstable. That's the scary reality we could face if a powerful quake hits along the New Madrid fault line running through Missouri, Illinois, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Experts warn it's not a question of if, but when this will occur. The big question is, how do we evacuate hundreds of thousands of people when the shaking starts? That's where researchers from the University of Missouri come in. They've received close to $300,000 in funding to determine the best escape routes 
for about 300,000 residents living right in the potential disaster zone. It won't be easy, though. These researchers have to account for potential bridge damage or failures, liquefaction, and a massive number of people all trying to flee in the same direction. Robbie Myers, the emergency manager for Butler County, is still shaken up from a minor 4.0 quake last November, so he knows how bad a larger one could be. According to the research team, heading west away from the Mississippi River and its liquefaction risks may be the best option. They're using computer models to simulate different damage scenarios and see how that impacts evacuation routes and timeframes. The team is even looking at developing mobile apps to guide people to the safest routes in real time based on the latest conditions. But it's not just about number crunching. The researchers are also surveying local residents to understand how they would likely respond and behave during an evacuation. After all, even the best plan is useless if people don't follow it. Once this study wraps up, the team plans to turn their attention to the St. Louis metro area next to assess evacuation strategies for that major city. Let's be clear, if the new Madrid fault seriously ruptures, it's going to be extremely chaotic. But this research aims to give us the best possible chance of getting people out safely. So stay tuned for those evacuation apps and updates. A little preparation could go a long way. At the end of the day, we can't control when Mother Nature decides to really shake things up in the central U.S., but hopefully, with careful planning and effort, we can improve our odds of outrunning her destructive wrath when it inevitably happens. A clergyman has come to say God has given him a vision of mass destruction in the U.S.A. This is a stunning vision of apocalyptic destruction unlike anything witnessed before. Is this clergy's revelation a divine prophecy or a mere figment of imagination? The scary details will leave you stunned. Keep watching. Clergy Receives Vision of USA Mass Destruction In a startling revelation, a member of the clergy has come forward with a vivid account of a prophetic dream he believes was given to him by God, foretelling a series of catastrophic events that could bring mass destruction to parts of the United States. The man, who prefers to remain anonymous, recounts the chilling details of his dream with a sense of urgency and conviction. According to his testimony, the Lord showed him a massive earthquake that would strike along the Madrid fault line, a seismic zone that runs through parts of the central United States. It was the largest earthquake that ever had happened on the earth, he exclaims, his voice trembling with the weight of what he witnessed. The dream portrayed a devastating scene where the Earth's violent tremors split the mighty Mississippi River, causing bridges to collapse and fires to erupt in the surrounding areas. He describes total destruction, a path of utter devastation stretching from the Gulf Coast region near New Orleans all the way up to the bustling city of Chicago. The imagery is so vivid that he can almost smell the smoke from the fires, a haze hanging thick in the air. But the chaos didn't end there. In the aftermath of this catastrophic quake, the narrator found himself witnessing a frantic effort to restore vital supply lines and bring aid to the affected regions. With the bridges down and semi-trucks unable to transit from east to west, the military stepped in, deploying floating bridges along the highways to facilitate emergency relief efforts. The army brought in these bridges that were on the army. They were like floating bridges, he recalls and they put them all up and down where the highways were, trying to make it so trucks could come in and out for emergencies. However, even with these makeshift solutions, the disruption was too great, and the traditional supply routes remained impassable. That's when the skies became the lifeline, as massive cargo planes took to the air, dropping food supplies into cities that had been cut off from ground transportation. The narrator's dream then took an even more ominous turn. He describes a deafening roar filling the air, the sound of massive Chinook helicopters flying in formation from the west coast towards the east. Standing on his back porch, he can see and smell the smoke from distant fires as the helicopters thunder overhead, shaking the very foundations of his home. There were probably like 30 or 40 of them at a time, but it was so much, it would shake the houses, he recounts, his voice tinged with shock and fear. The dream then shifted its focus to the heart of America's financial power, New York City. In a surreal vision, the narrator found himself gazing upon the iconic stone lions that adorn the New York Stock Exchange building. 
but the streets below were eerily deserted, with tumbleweeds rolling through the empty canyons of concrete and steel, as if the city had been abandoned in the wake of some cataclysmic event. It was like desolate. Nobody was moving around, he says. It was completely blank, like the people had all gone and were hiding out or something because the whole government, everything was shut down again. Kind of like how COVID was. It was really weird, but the visions didn't stop there. He claimed the Lord then showed him another earthquake, an aftershock that struck near the Texarkana area, sending tremors all the way up to Tulsa, Oklahoma. This time, the devastation was focused on the region's residential areas, with houses built on cinder blocks bearing the brunt of the destruction. He solemnly recounts that he could see that all the houses that were built on cinder blocks, the block houses, not on a flat slab, were completely destroyed, and in this, 1,800 people lost their lives. The narrator's dream was so vivid, so detailed, that he couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding, as if these events were not merely figments of his imagination, but prophetic glimpses into a future that could unfold at any moment. I don't know why it happens, I don't know when it happens, he admits. All I know is, is that I saw this, and I have prayed over this, and I feel that it's about to happen soon. It could happen in the fall, it could happen in the spring, I don't know, or it could be years from now. As he shares his story, the weight of his conviction is real. He speaks with the passion of a man who believes he has been tasked with delivering a message of grave importance a warning of impending calamity that could shake the very foundations of the nation. If you've seen this, or you've heard of anybody that's seen this, you can comment in the comment section, he implores, his voice carrying a sense of urgency. While the interpretation of such visions is often a matter of debate and speculation, the narrator's account serves as a sobering reminder of the power of faith and the enduring human fascination with prophecies and omens. Whether these visions are indeed cues of a catastrophic future or merely the product of an overactive subconscious, they have clearly left a profound impact on the narrator, an impact he feels compelled to share with the world in the hopes that, perhaps, someone might heed his warning. As the world grapples with an ever-increasing collection of natural and man-made threats, stories like these tap into our collective fears and anxieties while also offering a glimpse into the depths of human spirituality and our innate desire to find meaning in the inexplicable. Imagine a world where North America is torn asunder, divided into two continents by unimaginable forces. This incredible story reveals just how close the continent came to permanent rupture. Stay tuned, how North America almost separated into two parts. Can you imagine if the United States and Canada were split down the middle? Where the Great Lake is not a connected chain, but part of a large ocean separating two continents? Believe it or not, this almost happened about 1.1 billion years ago, during what geologists call the Mid-Continent Rift event. It was a time when the heart of North America nearly tore itself apart. For over a billion years, the continent that would become modern-day North America sat relatively boring and unchanging. In fact, many scientists refer to this period as the Boring Billion because virtually nothing of consequence happened evolutionarily or geologically. Well, except for that one dramatic episode when the entire continent tried to split in half. If North America had succeeded in ripping itself apart, the region around Lake Superior would have become a brand new ocean basin. But instead of a vast sea splitting the continent, we're left with an enormous underground scar stretching across the continent's midsection. This incredible gash underfoot is known as the Mid-Continent Rift. You'd never know it by looking at the relatively flat Midwestern United States today, but the continent was this close to separating into two land masses over one billion years ago. Geologists didn't even realize anything dramatic had occurred until the 1940s when they started mapping out gravitational variations across America. Gravity seems constant everywhere we go, but it actually varies minutely from place to place based on the density of the underlying rocks. More dense rocks have a slightly stronger gravitational pull. 
Using sensitive instruments called gravimeters, scientists can precisely measure these minuscule changes in gravity to learn what kind of rocks are beneath the surface. When the first detailed gravity maps emerged from the nation's center, they revealed something very strange. A massive region of higher gravitational force stretching from Ontario down to Kansas. This meant there were extremely dense rocks buried deep underground across the entire middle of the continent. Geologists dubbed this the mid-continent gravity high. After further study connecting this to surface volcanic rocks around Lake Superior, scientists realized they were dealing with an underground scar of unimaginable proportions. In a revelation, they discovered the dense underground rocks extended in an arc from Oklahoma all the way up to Lake Superior and then curved back down through Michigan, Illinois, and into Alabama. So what exactly were these incredibly dense mystery rocks? Analysis showed they were made of 1.1 billion-year-old flood basalts, a type of volcanic rock formed from the rapid cooling of stupendous amounts of lava gushing out onto the surface. Geologists calculated that a staggering 2 million cubic kilometers of molten rock erupted out across the continent to create these enormous basalt deposits. To put that into perspective, if all that lava came from a single volcanic vent, the flow would have covered the entire state of California in 30 feet of molten rock. It immediately raised the question, what cataclysmic event happened over 1 billion years ago to unleash such unimaginable volcanic fury in the heart of the ancient North American continent? The rift itself provided the clues. In the 1950s, pioneering geologists proposed that the mid-continent rift resulted from the continent literally starting to split apart into two landmasses. They were absolutely right, but many mysteries remained about the rift's origin, development, and eventual failure to lead to the birth of a new ocean basin. Through studying modern examples like Africa's East African Rift, scientists now believe they understand what transpired. The story began with the breakup of an ancient supercontinent called Rodinia around 1.1 billion years ago. At the time, Rodinia was in the final stages of the Wilson Cycle, the process where supercontinents form and break apart into smaller continents, which then come back together millions of years later into a new supercontinent. One of these separating land masses was called Amazonia, which started drifting away from the core North American continent we now call Laurentia. As Amazonia broke off and pushed away from Laurentia, it essentially started pulling and stretching the North American continent from the side. This sideways force from Amazonia's separation is called passive rifting. It caused the crust underlying Laurentia to thin and weaken, allowing ultra-hot mantle material to rise from below. Around this same time, an upwelling blanket plume also happened to be directly beneath Laurentia's stretched, weakened crust. As blanket material rose, it melted the overlying rock and created a rising pool of magma that started erupting out across the lands to form the massive flood basalts. In essence, Laurentia developed both a passive rift driven by Amazonia pulling away and an active rift where a mantle plume simultaneously pushed up, heated, and melted everything. This created the perfect rift conditions for trying to split the continent in half. If everything went according to plan, eventually, the mid-continental rift would have successfully ripped Laurentia into two separate continents. In the gap between them, a new ocean basin would have flooded in and started the familiar process of forming a mid-ocean ridge where seafloor spreading could take place. However, something caused the entire rifting process to grind to a halt after around 15 million years of activity. Thanks to the immense volume of basalt flows, we can date the duration of volcanic eruptions that accompanied the rifting event before everything stopped. For a while, geologists thought the answer was that a later continental collision called the Grenville Orogeny essentially crushed the rift zone and zipped Laurentia back together. There's a line of heavily deformed rocks, the Grenville Front, reaching from Ontario to Michigan that seemed to intersect and terminate the buried arm of the failed rift. However, more recent geologic investigations have concluded that the Grenville Front formed after the rifting had already ceased. The collision couldn't have been the main culprit in stopping the rupture of Laurentia. A more likely explanation is that once Amazonia finished separating and drifting far enough away, the sideways stress it induced stopped pulling on Laurentia's crust. 
Without that tensional force, the continent bound back together instead of continuing to split. Essentially, the rift event only needed about 15-20 million years to accomplish its mission of detaching Amazonia before everything returned to normal. We see similar cases of failed rifts today, such as Africa's Rift Valley, where rifting initiated as the continent separated from South America, but stopped once spreading and shifted fully into the Atlantic Ocean Basin. While the mid-continent rift may have failed to create a new ocean separating North America, it left behind an indelible mark across the lands. Once the volcanic eruptions ceased, rivers and erosion gradually buried the dark basalt flows under sedimentary rocks, but the immense rift scar and dense basalt deposits remained entombed underground. Over the next half billion years, the North American plate experienced periods of compression, during which the rift zone and its encompassing rocks became uplifted and exposed again at the surface. Around this time, glaciers also scrubbed away the top sediment layers, revealing the hard basalt layers underneath across huge swaths of Ontario and the upper Midwest states. This process is what carved out the modern Great Lakes region, including Lake Superior, which lies directly over the main arm of the rift. The rugged shorelines, islands, and cliffs surrounding Lake Superior all originate from the volcanic and tectonic forces that nearly tore the continent apart 1.1 billion years earlier. Geologists call the mid-continent rift the deepest failed rift zone that didn't end up becoming a new ocean basin. Even after all this time, the buried scar remains a lasting reminder of just how close ancient North America came to permanently splitting into two continents before sealing itself back up. Preserved in the rocks is a fleeting glimpse of our continent pulling itself apart before violently reversing its course. Share your thoughts in the comment section. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more interesting videos.